Ciao, Eddie Carmen. Welcome to another episode here for the Funky Pod, Mindful Media and Communication. And you catch me laughing here a little bit when I do the intro because, well, today's episode, I'm not sure how mindful the communication has been uh, in the topic that we're discussing. You've seen it. We're talking about the roast of Tom Brady. Why? Well, it's a bust right now, right? Everyone's talk, been talking about it since it came out. A few days ago, live on Netflix, a live Netflix comedy special. So a comedy live event streamed live on Netflix. You can still watch it now, of course. Um, they don't do that many live events just yet. So that was kind of interesting that they done one again. And yeah, it's a roast, like the, the return of the roast. We haven't seen like those hardcore roasts in a while. Maybe you've seen some roast battles on Comedy Central or whatnot. But like those big mainstream roasts, I think the last one was like 10, 11, 11 years ago, right? Donald Trump um, had a, this big one. But other than that, since then, not much has been roasted. Not many people have been hardcore roasted. So it was, it was interesting to see this coming back. As a non-American, um, roasting is not in my culture, not in my genetics, if you will. Um, I got exposed to it like decades ago when I... And I started consuming more American uh, media, so I'm used to it. Um, I do understand that people from certain backgrounds, certain cultures might feel a bit different about it. Nevertheless, I think just talking about it is, is interesting right now, just to see like a few, yeah, a few media theories actually, because that's what we do in this podcast, right? Analyzing why things are happening, how things are happening. And I think I can make a point as to make you understand why the roast happens or happened now again and why we might see more now happening um and yeah maybe even why why there weren't any of those roasts because it used to be quite famous in the us and then it died out a little and now it's it's coming back slowly so i think we can talk about this and actually before i analyze the actual roast let's talk about it that break of like 10 11 years right why I think it's a cultural thing. It's like the political correctness wave was just so big, so popular. Cancel culture was running um, like through the US in other countries too, but in the US like more, more so, I believe. And I think that's why lots of companies, maybe even comedians, but lots of companies. And let's be honest, the fun part at roasts is usually the non-comedians like going all comedian. Right? For, you expect it from comedians to be like all funny and, and edgy and stuff. But then if like someone like Tom Brady or like his former former um, teammates start roasting him, you're like, oh, wow, they got lines. I mean, lines written for them, but still they can deliver them. And so I think that the past 10 years, people are just too too scared, too aware of like, I don't want to end up getting, a, getting shit stormed at. I don't want to be canceled. Um, and that's why... No, I don't, I don't want to invest in like a roast if I'm Netflix, if I'm, if I'm a Hulu, if I'm whatever, right? HBO. So I think that's why we didn't see any roasts over the past decade or so. And now, um, slowly, I think the tide is turning again. Like, well, cancel culture is dying out more or less. Like, we see less of those cancel movements. People embrace sarcasm, irony, and so on more again. And so I think we see a, we see a shift slowly. And we, now we see it also in, in US culture, US pop culture. And maybe a roast of the goat, um, eh, debate to be debated, the white goat, as Bert Kreischer called him. Um, yeah, maybe that's like, like a turning point right now for mainstream streaming and slash TV. Okay, so I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen roast before, like in the past 10 years, 11 years. But I think with all of the success this one had now, because it seemed to be very successful, everyone's talking about it. Um, I think we will see more of those. Um, good for Jeff Ross. <laughs> um, so which theories did, did they use, right? Um, why, why was it such a success? I think the first theory we need to discuss, and we discussed it many a times on this podcast, but I just want to make it a point to really drive home that point that this theory is really important um, because it's what drives us, the audience, uh, is the uses and gratification theory. Okay, the, the use and gratification theory basically talks about the purpose of viewing in this case, right? So many viewers watch comedy roasts, comedy shows to satisfy certain needs, use and gratification, okay? The, those needs could be entertainment, relaxation. Sometimes it's even some form of like catharsis, if you want, 
And the roles of Tom Brady featuring like this super famous sports god, if, <laughs> right, meets this need for humor while also addressing like this public curiosity about celebrities, about like his love life, like, as you know, probably got divorced from Giselle Bündchen. Um, uh, like all those things that have been made public and that's what, what keeps us like invested, right? We're like, oh, what's it? What are people going to say about him and her and all the other, deflate gate and things. What are people going to say about this? And so that, that use and gratification, okay? Um, also, when we, when we talk about social interaction, also like a big part of use and gratification, right? This event, I mean, I'm talking to you about it right now, right? Social interaction, this, this event like provides the material for, for social discourse, discussion, like Twitter X was a bus um, with, with the roast of Tom Brady. Like every other podcast, this included, talks about the roast of Tom Brady. Like at work, especially in the US, I assume people talked about like how Tom Brady got roasted, how Tom Brady looked like and whatnot. They talk about like shared jokes, their reactions, their personalities that came out. Like did you see, did you see uh, what X said about him? Did you see Kim Kardashian, what, what she said? Uh, you're like, what? Wow. Uh, huh? Um, so that was just the crazy, crazy thing um, to put on, and it works. It satisfied our needs, and did it to like a, a, a great extent for like three hours plus or so. Um, another theory that we talk about a lot on this podcast, and it also fits very well here, is agenda setting. Right? We always talk about like that agenda setting utilizes things such as like framing theories to drive home the agenda, right? So how do I frame certain things? And the roast, of course, places Tom Brady like in a, in a frame, right? In a specific light. So this frames him as like a good sport who can handle jokes as if his expense. He's so cool. He's so funny. And then in the end, the last 10 minutes, he can come back and has some great lines and so on. And so this shapes the public perception of, of his persona especially beyond the football field. Now that he's retired, right? It's important to shape his persona beyond the field and this makes him look like a very, very chill, very fun, down to earth. Like he can take the, he can, he can take the hits <laughs> in this case. So a smart move by Tom Brady, Tom Brady's PR team to say like, hey, let them roast you. Just sit there three hours, smile. It's going to be good for your career. Yeah, so that's, all, that's a framing part, okay? And again, just to connect it to what we just said earlier, that also influences public discourse, of course, right? Because specific jokes and topics are elevated to like a talking point, to what the, the audience talks about after the event, um, such as in this case, of course, Brady's career, the controversies, deflate gate, for example, his personal life, Chisel Bündchen and so, and so on. They are now central themes on social media and on the discussions on social media after the roast is done. Okay, so that's a very smart move again. And I'll, I'll stick to like those, those mainstream theories for now just because I think that Rose provides like such a nice, such a nice, I don't know, coherent, yeah, coherent timeline frame uh, of reference for us to like see oh, how those theories are at work. So, for example, another one, the cultivation theory that we discussed many a times also on the podcast, right? The cultivation theory. I think in this, ki in this case, it shows that like stereotypes and humor can be cultivated. And what I mean by that is like, like comedy, like roasts often, like com they rely on like stereotypes, right? Stere you stereotype someone to get something funny out of it. And this can and reinforce certain beliefs or certain ideas over time. In, in Tom Brady's case, like stereotypes about athletes, aging stars, those controversies again, deflate gate and so on, might be like, like humorously exaggerated and this couldn't possibly also influence the audience perception and to be fair it wasn't only tom brady getting roasted right? every everybody would get it like gronkowski got, got like all the banter in the world about him not being the smartest person in the room and so on everyone made fun everybody made fun of kevin hart um it was hilarious but like tom brady was the central figure so that's why i just used the tom brady examples right now but everybody in in attendance basically would get it um this then also leads to, to like cultural norms being influenced by that, I believe, by the cultivation theory. So because the roasts have, have been in a long time back then, like a significant cultural phenomenon, now it's coming back and people who used it like, yeah, it's back. And people who are now exposed to it are like, wow, that, 
that's really impactful. So it, it, it has some cultural impact, right? We can discuss how much of a cultural impact it has. It used to have a lot. Let's see if it can can go back to the the old times. Um, but it's nice that it was normal to poke fun at celebrities, and now maybe we we are, we are reaching that point again. Yeah. And so the, this roast of Tom Brady and everybody else in attendance just reinforces this norm that it's okay to poke at celebrities because I mean in the end they're making money of being celebrities, so. It's okay to, to poke them once in a while um, if they agree to it, right? And it also highlights, though, the limits of like what's acceptable, accept, uh, acceptable in, a, in comic discourse. And that relates to what I said in the beginning of the podcast, that it seems to be there's more acceptable again in the com comedic discourse. Less, oh my God, the cancellation screams and less PC, like, finger-pointing, I think, which is great. Um, the only one who got some, some oohs, <laughs> which was hilarious, was uh, Tony Hinchcliffe, uh, my favorite of, 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 of the whole event. I had a few, there were a few dots in there, one very famous one that you probably all heard of, but also a few others that weren't that great. Lots of, lots of funny stuff. I was a bit disappointed by Andrew Schultz. There were, like, some, they were pretty basic and... I'm going to have to, I'm, I'm already sorry because I know we have, um, if I take it off my head, we have a similar haircut by now, Andrew Schultz, because my, my head was effed up. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's like, it's the formula is not too easy to, to see with Andrew Schultz, I believe. Like, it's like this, like, uh, throw out a singer, and then go like, before the audience can react, it's like, hey, guys, oh, guys, 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 and then, why is it like guys, 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 guys? He expects the audience to be like, ha, ah, ha, so funny. Um, not, not to say that he's never funny, but it's just that formula is like a bit repetitive by now. Um, but nevertheless, like Tony Hinchcliffe was amazing. Uh, Tony Hinchcliffe, like to to quote or to steal this from, from Joe Rogan, murdered. Um, he murdered hearts. Tony is such a beast. Eh? <laughs> I could, I could be, a, I could do a Joe Rogan episode. Um, the Tony Insta was, because it was smart, but it was also very edgy, like very, like very, very fine, like a, blurring the lines is what I'm trying to say. Like he blurred the lines and maybe overstepped once or twice, but that's what you want to see from a comedian. And he was like very, very secure and like also his, his delivery from most people, you could see that they were reading from a prompter, but Tony was like walking while he was talking. So it looked like very, very like safe you, you couldn't tell that he was reading from the prompter that was that was pretty cool um he saved his bodies a little bit like he made like a one or two throwaway references to like Bert Kreischer and Andrew Schultz but it wasn't too bad because they're all bodies of course but the rest was was on point so that was pretty cool and to see that that apparently this goes again so great I love it um yeah so maybe we're cultivating this sense of humor again which is fantastic um the last two that I wanted to, to, to mention is like um, the reception series, one of those. Because, and we talked about reception before, but I want to add like a new wrinkle to it. So if you listen to the podcast before, you're like, oh, yeah, I know perception theory. I hope so. Um, even if not, I'm going to explain now. But I want to add like a little wrinkle to it, which is like, which we call in media theory, um, polysemy. Okay, that's like the, the, the little wrinkle. Ah, let me explain. So this means that different audiences, they're going to interpret, interpret, not a native speaker, sorry, interpret the roast differently, okay? So diehard Tom Brady fans, if there are, yeah, I think there are, they, they say it like as a playful, like camaraderie, if you will, while others, they might view it as like something justifiable criticism of Tom Brady. Like finally, they, they talk about like deflate gate and like his, his marriage going down the drain and stuff like this. So you have the hardcore fans are like, yeah, it's so cool that he takes us on the gin. And others are like, yeah, finally people tell him to his face, even if it's in a funny way, but finally, yeah, exactly. People, people take, take the piss. Um, and this variability yeah, shows how media content can be, very important, can be decoded uniquely by diverse viewers. If you're a media student or if you're working in the media, you know that for others, like, let me quickly explain. So what's very important when it comes to, to media creation, but also media consumption, is 
in the very basic model you learn like in your first semester to study this is like a decoding encoding model there are different ones out there from different researchers but like encoding and decoding that means like imagine yeah, you have like person a sending the message and person b receiving the message right the thing is as you know from real life if i if a says something b might not understand it the way that A intended it to be, right? And now why is that the case? There's like several reasons, right? So in between, between like A and B, it's not like a direct line, like, hey, let me tell you what I feel and here, take it. And then, oh yeah, I understand what you mean. There are different, different forces impacting the way B understands what A is saying, right? This could be like the channel that you're using to send it, for example, the message. So if I, if I send you a message on like a messenger, for example, it seems less serious than in an email or less serious than in maybe like a, a call or a letter for to get a letter from your employer from your university you're like oh my god why did i get a letter ah that must be serious oh my god what did i do to get a text message you're like ah yeah whatever even though the content could be the same right that's like what marsh McLuhan said for example with the medium is the message so the channel that i used to send the message on in, impacts how i understand the message right but this is not the only thing it's also like like your surrounding how how are you growing up right so if I'm like in my in, in like an ivory tower, for example, I will understand messages differently to if I grew up in in, in the suburbs or like in the ghetto or like no offense, like we, in Bangkok we have to we have those two, right? So if I grew up like in like like poorer circumstances, for example, and if I grew up witnessing violence compared to never witnessing anything rough in the streets, for example, so then I understand messages being sent completely differently. Maybe I understand it's something as a joke, while if I grew up like without parents, I understand things like as like a threat. I'm like, hey, did you just threaten me? And it's, no, no, I was, I was joking, man. I was joking. Yeah, you really? It's not funny. All right, so different impact factors influence the way we understand messages. And so here too, right, how an audience understands the roast, for example. Like, yeah, he's funny. He's my guy. So cool. Hey, I love Tom Brady. Or like, yeah, that, that's, that SOB, he deserves it. Like, F Tom Brady, for example, right? So, that's like the reception theory. And that, that leads us to what we call negotiated readings. Okay. So yeah, while some viewers might enjoy the humor, but still feel maybe uncomfortable with some, with some of those edgy jokes um, that cross like maybe personal boundaries. This could then lead to mixed reception. Right? So some think it's hilarious how Kevin Hart always like talks and then he turns to the, to the right of his and he's like, uh, Fuck you, Tom Brady. <laughs> now I said the F word on my podcast, now I'm demonetized. Uh, well, too late. So here yeah, he would just talk about something. He's like, F you, Tom Brady. And he would just continue talking. So this was kind of funny in the moment, but maybe that crossed some personal boundaries because uh, it was the F word, for example. Okay, so that's negotiated, an example of negotiated reading. Okay, the last, uh, the last theory I'm going to talk about today, my favorite theory, if you follow the podcast, um, postmodern theory, because postmodern simply includes almost everything that we see in modern day media. Um, one of those things that is like an integral part of postmodern theory is the blurring of reality and what we call in postmodern theory, hyper reality. And we talked about this on the podcast before. The reality, what you see is what you get. Hyper reality is like this negotiated, this mediated reality, the reality that you see on the screen, on on Instagram, on social media, but that you then take as reality. Even though we know it's not, it's fake, it's staged, but it's the only exposure we have to the celebrity, the person we follow, whatever, the person you're stalking. <laughs> it's the only reference point, so that's what makes it real for us, and then it becomes hyper-reality, okay? So it's, uh, and hyper-reality is always, of course, like exaggerated nature of, of like real life. We, we never just publish post mundane things we only post like cool awesome things right and this now exaggerated nature of the roast as well plays with the it idea of like hyper reality like where jokes are of course grounded in truth right but also exaggerated to like the point of fiction of course to make it more funny and that's what that's what comedians do so the, this hyperbolic commentary around tom brady in this case and all the others on stage may like blur the line between his real persona tom brady and that caricature uh, like that you create on stage like this this bigger than life tom brady thing right um who said it i think it was tony inchcliffe who said like 
Tom Brady, why do you look like a gay Tom Brady? So, so like blurring the lines, like all those those cliche stereotypes, those those gossips that are, that are out there, right? And postmodernism also very very heavily relies on intertextuality. That means references. So you, my text. So everything we create in the media is called a text. It could be written, it could be video, music, podcast. Everything we call text. Okay, so. Intertextuality means I reference other texts within my text. Prime example right now, Kendrick Lamar and Drake. And I'm not making a video on this because two grown-up rappers beefing. Okay, I, I, I hate those air quotes. So if you watch the video, I just did two air quotes. Um, but two grown-up rappers, multi-billionaires, millionaires, whatever, beefing. Oh, and the whole internet talking about it, like, get a life, people. <laughs> I'm not making a video on that, I, seriously. But, like, so they're, but they're referencing each other all the time. That's intertextuality, right? Um, lots of media right now is intertextual. Lot, lots of videos, lots of shows on Netflix are intertextual, like Cobra Kai, for example, of course. Lots of Karate Kid references because, like, the continuation of Karate Kid, um, for example. And lots of those those shows like Game Game of Thrones and House of the Dragons in the textuality, but also like sometimes you see like a Family Guy cameo within The Simpsons, for example, or vice vice versa, for example. That's that's also in the textuality. So it could be in songs and in, in movies and shows, books. I mean, you know, I work at a university, so if if I if I write content and I reference other content, that's also kind of in the textuality. Actually, if you write an academic paper, it could also be kind of in the textuality. Mm. Sick. Think about it. Um, so that's intertextuality, okay? And so in the roast, yeah, those jokes, they might refer to Tom Brady's on-field achievements, his personal relationships, cultural impact, and so on. And, and they create like this layered commentary that assumes some knowledge of like those, those intertextual references. Like people know his football achievements, they know his personal struggles, and so on, okay? So that's like intertextuality. Okay. So I think that that's enough of like teaching... Uh, content it's been 20 minutes already but i just found this like like while i was watching the roast of tom brady now on netflix not affiliated but check it out three hours though it's quite long um while i was watching it, i was like i can see all those theories at play right now so i i have to to talk to you guys about it because i just found it um awesomely laid out if, if you will um to wrap things up once more i think it's interesting to see like how comedy is coming back around now um, how people are getting less and less offended again, which I found find interesting from a also sociolo sociological point of view. Um, does that also mean I can make more jokes in, at university again? We, I will I will try and I will let you know. <laughs> um, but overall, it was kind of a funny show. It was like I said, some dots in there, but three hours is a long time to fill. I think Tony Hinchcliffe was hilarious. Um, he blurred the lines very well. I think Kevin Hart was very funny too. Um, sometimes he's a bit like too to uh, family but in this case it was he was he was pretty funny and like also edgy at times which was appreciated um some of the guests were cool um grokowski was grokowski which was also hilarious um the only thing that was really disappointing besides the one thing that i'm not going to talk about because it's all about social media and it was very obvious and the other thing that disappointed were like um what's like bert kreischer and what's the other dude tom segura Bing. They're just not funny anymore. It was very disappointing. And you can you can see both of them just staring at the prompter and just reading what's on the prompter. And then they were presenting at the same time. And they had like like a TV behind them. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a university presentation with like pictures, funny pictures, but pictures like popping up. And you're like, am I seeing a PowerPoint presentation right now? And then Bert was like, hey, da da da. And then Tom was like, oh yeah, nah, 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 nah. and then Bert was like, oh yeah, by the way, and it was like this. Back and forth, like, at a, like in, a, in a school university presentation, I, I felt really uncomfortable watching that. So that, that was, that was, this was not funny. The rest was very interesting. So if you haven't, check it out. Um, let me know what you think about the roast of Tom Brady. Did you think Tom Brady handled it well, by the way, at the end, the last 10 minutes, where he, like, where he had like, a chance to defend himself and then roast everybody back? It was kind of some nice lines and he delivered them well. Um, so let me know what you think. Did you like the roast of Tom Brady uh, until then? Until when? Soon. Uh, I already have the next podcast lined up because I, I want to talk about something else. And that's like close to my heart. So that's going to come soon in a few days. Until then, stay safe. Take care. Like, share, subscribe. Otherwise, I'm going to roast you. Um, 
All the best. Enjoy the weekend. And we talk soon. สวัสดีครับ